We've never seen the Holy Ghost. We've never seen an angel. We might have seen an angel. We've never seen an archangel. We've never seen Michael or Gabriel. Or we've never seen a cherubim or a seraphim. We, we, we've never even seen God's grace. We've never seen anybody who wrote the Bible, right? We've never seen anybody who wrote the Bible. We've never seen the virtues that God commands, any of his grace that he gives, although we see the results of them. He's doing it again. <laughs> you, you see... Our, we, but yet we live in, in conviction of all these things by faith. We bank our entire lives and our eternal destiny on things we just have not seen. That's tough when you think about it. But that's faith. That's what faith is. And this is the way the people of God have always lived. And the life of faith has some special ingredients which are pointed out in today's text as reflected in the life of Abraham. Abraham is the composite of God's pattern of faith. Now, we, we looked at three amazing examples of, of with Noah and Enoch and Abraham. Or, I'm sorry, Noah, Enoch, and Abel. But he was the first man, really, of faith. He is the father of faith. Abraham is, again, the composite of the pattern of faith. He reveals the totality of the true life of faith and all, all the ingredients that constitute it. I mean, think about it. Abraham was the father of the Jewish people, and he is therefore presented to the Jews to whom this entire book was written about as the greater example of faith. He is the model of faith. What the Jews didn't comprehend was they needed to realize that Abraham was more than just the father of their race. By example, he was also by example the father of the faithful, the father of everyone who lives by faith in God. The rabbis well, they had long thought that Abraham pleased God because of what Abraham did. They thought, they taught that God was up there in the heavens looking around the whole earth to see if there's anyone righteous, and they found Abraham. Because Abraham was righteous, and he was selected to be God's chosen people. Absolutely false. But unfortunately, to this day, the Jews still believe that. That Abraham was saved because he was righteous. Absolutely false. And it is necessary to show from the Old Testament itself, which the writer of Hebrews does perfectly, that Abraham was not righteous in himself, but was counted righteous by God because of his trust and his faith. I remember when Stephen was preaching to the Jewish leaders during his, his uh, trial in Jerusalem. He began by showing how Abraham immediately trusted God by, uh, by leaving his homeland and believing in God's promises. Acts chapter 7 records this. This is wonderful. He says, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. He lived in Haran and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. 
yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. Also, in his powerful argument in the book of Romans, the justification by faith, Paul uses Abraham as a beautiful illustration. He, he, he dedicated an entire chapter to Ab the faith of Abraham in, in chapter 4. I'm going to read some of it. Paul says this in verse 1, chapter 4 of Romans. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. He went on to say in verse 13, For the promise to Abraham and his offering that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offsprings, not only to the inheritor of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Paul's confirming here that Abraham is the classic example of a life of faith, something the early Jewish Christians knew. The early Jewish Christians knew that. For a Jew to accept that truth, that salvation is by faith, he needed to be shown that this very truth first applied to Abraham. Now, the Jews did look to Abraham as a father figure, but all in the wrong way. Only in the way of ancestry, not in the way of believing and trusting God. The problem was they looked at him the wrong way. They knew that he pleased God, but they had to be shown that God was pleased with him, not because anything good Abraham did, but because of he trusted in God. The New Testament makes it crystal clear that Abraham was the first true man of faith. And since his time, everyone who puts their trust in God, Jew or Gentile, is spiritually a child of Abraham. New, New, New Testament backs it up. Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3. Now know, or I'm sorry, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Galatians again, chapter 3, verse 23. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And those who trusted God before the flood, uh, flood, flood such as Abel and, and Enoch and Noah, whom the writer started this chapter off with, were only partial examples of faith, while Abraham was the first established man of faith. He is the pattern. He is the prototype of faith for everyone who has come after him, including us. We are heirs of Abraham. He is also, when you think about Abraham, one of the longest accounts in the entire New Testament. That's how important this man was from Genesis chapter 12 through 25 in the book of Genesis. He's also the longest example of faith listed here in Hebrews chapter 11, using 11 verses. Everybody else was just one or two. There's 11 verses talking about the life of Abraham. And it was through him that God gave the covenant of grace by which we are saved. And even though we're not Jewish, again, we are the spiritual descendants of of Abraham. Therefore, our faith rests in part of God's faithfulness to Abraham. Paul confirmed that in Romans chapter 4, verse 11. He says the purpose was to make him the father of all who believe. His faith provided the model that we today must follow. Perfect example. Remember, Jesus even responded to the Jews boast that they were children of Abraham. Remember? Oh, we're children of Abraham. We got it all. So we, we got it all figured out. And what did Jesus say? If you were of Abraham, if you were children of Abraham, you would be doing as Abraham did. Well, which is what? Which is believing and trusting in God. Not just by because you were born Jewish. But they, that's what the whole book of Hebrews was, basically. So given all this, we're not surprised the writer pays much attention to Abraham, taking up 11 verses about his life here in chapter 11. And three times in these 11 verses, he starts off with the text, by faith, Abraham. So we're going to look deeply at Abraham's faith used in the next few weeks, depending on how fast you listen, uh, unpacking these 11 outstanding verses. So let's dive into this study of Abraham. Let's look at verses 8. He says, by faith. Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. The story of Abraham really begins and starts in Genesis chapter 12. 
giving, giving a brief biography of Abraham's father, who was Terah. This is what Genesis 12 says. Now the Lord said to Abram, before he changed his name, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It was never Abraham's plan to leave her and then to Haran and eventually settle in Canaan. He had, he had no plans on doing that. In fact, when he left there, the Bible says he had no idea where he was going. When he was called by God, only God knew where he was going. This is very important because this was not only the beginning of his salvation, but an important beginning in the history of God's redemptive work. Now, in the Greek here, the phrase he was called is really translated, he was being called. So I would put, I, actually I put it in my Bible already, he was being called. In other words, as soon as he understood that God was, what God was saying, he immediately started packing. Again, here's another one that didn't question God, just as Noah. He just listened to God and he just started packing. That's what happens when a person of God is called to faith. No one goes kicking and screaming. Have you ever seen one account in the Bible when God calls somebody that he goes kicking and screaming? No. Did you? When God calls a person to salvation, there's no other choice but to follow. Because as that song says, his will is stronger than you. <clears throat> Your will is to rebel against God. That's what you were born to do. But when God calls you, everything changes. And as Abraham, it was, we should listen, to, learn from Abraham, he just dropped everything. He was perfectly happy. I don't know who he's happy in the city of Ur. Ur. But he was happy there. When a God calls a person to faith, again, no one goes kicking and screaming. Listen, Romans chapter 8, verse 30. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. According to this text, everyone God predestined for salvation gets called, justified, and eventually glorified. It's a done deal. And that's what though we see in Abraham that faith acts in response to God's call. It is God's initiative that is emphasized at the beginning of Abraham's life of faith. God's sovereign grace that goes forth with his saving call. And it's extremely important to realize that Abraham was not saved because anything he did, anything that was special about him, that he worshipped more, that he prayed more, that he was a nice guy, he was an idolater. Abraham was not singled out because of his faith. His faith was in foreign gods. But because of God's sovereign choice through his marvelous grace, he was saved. In other words, he was God's first elect. God's remnant started with Abraham. That is why the Bible says he is the father of us all. Abraham never did anything good to please God, to catch God's eye as the Jews embraced and believed and taught. Even to this day, he did nothing good but worship foreign gods. Is that good? Is it good? It's no different than worshiping the devil, worshiping anything other than God. He was a heathen who grew up in an unbelieving idolatrous society who worshipped many gods. Now, we don't know exactly when or how God revealed himself to Abraham, but he was raised in a home that was utterly pagan. Even Joshua testifies. Joshua 24, 2. Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. Didn't sound like Abraham was righteous at all to me. His native city was Ur of the Chaldea, future Babylon, in the general region of Mesopotamia between the Tigris and the Euphrates, where the Babylon Empire was not. Isaiah chapter 51 also confirms, verses 1 through 2. He says, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. 
Nowhere in the Bible says Abraham was seeking God. Nowhere. Isaiah's point is that, that nothing in their ancestry commended them apart from God's sovereign choice in choosing people. Abraham was saved only because God sought him. Because it's God that always initiates salvation. We love him because he first loved us. The, the whole Bible is filled with this. This faith was preceded by God's call and responded to call, God's call. A call that came by grace alone through God's sovereign choice alone. Abraham never wanted to seek God, whom he never knew. He only knew other gods. He was a polytheist until God sought him. Paul clearly talked about the, describing this, the total depravity of man since the fall of mankind, which included Abraham. He was no better. Romans chapter 3. What then? Are Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. Let me, let me repeat that. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they become worthless. No one does good, no, not even one. And he ends it with, there is no fear of God before their eyes. This is the condition of every human being ever born since Adam's sin. This is your natural condition, natural condition since Adam's sin. If God did not call anyone, no one would be saved. And if God did not call anyone, he would be perfectly just in doing so. But aren't you glad God is a God of love? And God is a God of mercy. And God is a God of compassion. He didn't have to save anyone and he would be perfectly holy and righteous. That is the God you will not hear to this point. I got into a recent argument with about this on Facebook again. I am done with Facebook. That God is only a God of love. And I just responded, then why did he create a hell? Give me an absolute break. Is he a God of love? Nobody more loving. But he also says, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. That's for you. James Montgomery Boyce put it this way. I love this guy. We got every commentary. He says, in the way God called Abraham, God calls all who become his children. God comes to us when we are hopelessly lost in sin and completely without knowledge of him. He is completely spot on with that statement. And he got this from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Turn here, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Keep your place in Hebrews, of course. Starting in verse 1. And you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Here's my favorite but in the Bible, verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. For we are his worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, it is absolutely impossible to argue this fact that a person can be saved apart from God's sovereign call, for there is nothing a dead person can do but stay dead, spiritually speaking. God made us alive, which is why we are sitting here today, not because of anything we did, 
but because of his sovereign elect choice. Whatever means that was, whether you sat under the word of God, whether somebody prayed for you, whatever the means he used, it was his doing, not yours. Why? So what the Bible says, so no one can boast. Can you imagine? And here I go. Can you imagine walking up to God and go, hey, bet you glad I'm, I found you, huh? <laughs> a big guy upstairs. Can you imagine? <clears throat> wow. Taking credit for his glory, robbing his glory. But yet, I'll tell you, there's a whole denomination teaching that garbage. Whole denomination, many denominations teaching that garbage. This is a universal fact in the spiritual biography of all Christians. And our response, now we're responsible, ladies and gentlemen. We're not puppets. And our response to his calls nothing more than belief in him and his promises. That's our part. God chose Abraham because he wanted to choose him. And when God spoke, he listened. When God promised, he obeyed. When God commanded, he trusted. We are responsible. He called, but he's not going to do everything for us, which some think they, that, too. That's a hyper-Calvinism. There's a fine line, man. But when God calls, you're not going to go just kicking and screaming, but you are responsible for your faith. You need to obey. You need to trust. That is your part. And when any person comes to Jesus Christ, God demands of him to leave the pattern of his whole life behind into a new life. Just as Abraham separated from paganism and unbelief, God started him on a new land with a new life. He recommends the same for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any was in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. Because along with salvation, ladies and gentlemen, brings a separation from the world. And Abraham needed to separate himself from where he was living. God called him, he just went. God works in the heart the total willingness to leave behind everything that is not pleasing to him. Because he cannot lead us into new ways of living until he leads us out of the old. That's, our, that's where our, our part takes place. That's a response. That's an act of faith. Our response should sound something like this. Lord, I have no idea where you're going to lead me. I have no idea, but I'm just going to drop everything that does not line up with your word and your word. I don't know what you're doing, going to do to substitute them, but I'm going to let them go. I can't tell you the amount of baggage that I had in my life when God called me. And there are certain things that were easy to let go of that Abraham. I mean, think about Abraham. He just dropped everything. He left his family, his friends, his business, his religion. I mean, it seems, you know, he's Abraham. He can do that. He was no better than us. He was no different than you or I was. Is it easy leaving some of the things that we held so dear? <laughs> Ryan said, no. No, it's not. No. It's tough, man. It's a, it's a battle. And, and the more baggage you have, the tougher it is. Those who were born in the nursery, saved in the nursery. It's <laughs> not easy. They're usually the ones who fall by the wayside. Ooh, I got a taste of that other one. We have that other life and go on because you know we're elite. And you know, and I still struggle with stuff. There's still some things that just eat at me. Robbie got a whole list in her pocket book. <laughs> and especially because Satan knows you're saved. He knows. He knows you're saved. He surrounds you with fools. He surrounds you with fools. And God allows them. Because he's teaching you. He's bringing you through this training program. You think he put his son on a planet that was nice and going to love him? 
He knew what his son was going to do. Jesus was our, was our way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And as we grow in Christ, ladies and gentlemen, in, in our love for him, our love for the things of the world should diminish. <laughs> they simply should lose their attraction they once held to us. This was the attitude of Abraham. The life of faith begins with the willingness to leave your old ways behind. Your error, your one's place of sin and unbelief to completely leave the system of this world behind. But it's not easy. But here's some backup text. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? This is what happens when you marry an unbeliever. Galatians 1, 4. Who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. What this text proves to us is that the life of faith begins when God reveals himself to us. You remember when that day was? I remember the day, I remember the room, I remember the hour, and I remember what condition I was in. I didn't get a divine visitation like Abraham. Today, we don't receive divine visitations. If you do, just run away from that guy. Well, uh, God spoke, no, no. For us, it's hearing the word of God preached. Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You cannot be saved apart from hearing the word of God. It might be a prayer to drag you to that church. That's the means he will use, but you cannot be saved apart from hearing the words of truth. However, and I know some of you guys can testify, giving up this whole life is one, if not the greatest obstacle we will face as believers in Christ. <clears throat> it's something that doesn't go away easy. Why do you think Paul wrote to Romans chapter 7? Mm -hmm. and, Paul, and Brian and I talked about this on Friday. There was no coincidence, by the way. Why do I practice the things I hate? Because it's not easy. It's not. That's why you need to be in this every day. What's your daily hygiene, Pastor Bob? You need to be in this every day. You need to fellowship. You, you, need, you, need, to be, you, you need to pray every day. You need to be around other believers. This, this whole worshiping through Facebook, I'm sorry, guys. That's garbage. That's nonsense. Why are you doing it? I still got that. I got almost a full congregation here. That's why. <laughs> it's garbage. It's isolation. It's keeping people in isolation. You can't learn on your own. You can't learn on your own. The sweetest time a believer can have is on Sundays meeting with other believers. That's the sweetest time we have. You realize when I get home from church, I'm looking forward to next Sunday already? Or actually Wednesday. <laughs> hey, you had a good crowd Wednesday, Ron. People are starting to feel that vibe, man. Thank God for it. Amen, brother. But Abraham was immediately willing to give up his homeland, his friends, his business, and his religion to follow God and to live a life of faith that God called him. In other words, he gave up all his baggage, as we would say today. <clears throat> All that kept him separated from God, he needed to leave behind. Same with us. Anything that separated you from God, you need to give it up. You need to give it up. Whatever it is. But God doesn't make that easy for us, does he? Oh, he does not. There's so many things that the Lord took from me, but I still have problems with a lot of them. Because obviously I'm failing or somewhere. Abraham began by obeying God's call. He persevered by believing God's promises, but he had to be patient in doing so. 
So what this means is that the call of faith is always followed by a life of faith. That same principle that saved us enables us to live a life as saved people. Look at verse 9. By faith, he went to live in a land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac, Jacob, with heirs of him of the same promise. <laughs> Abraham began by obeying God's call and he persevered, but he had to be patient. Why? Because when Abraham got to Canaan, he didn't get what he wanted. He didn't get what he was promised. He didn't walk into this land, a land of milk and honey. I don't see anything. I see Canaanites all over the place, fortified cities everywhere. God, where's your promise? <clears throat> It's like when we pray, God, where's your answer? Immediately, everything immediately to us. So by faith, he lived there, not as an owner, which God promised, but as a stranger. According to this verse, he lived as a soldier, a resident alien in tents, not homes, in the very land that God promised would be his own. What does this tell us? Well, God doesn't hand over his promises to us immediately. Patience is such a key virtue in our faith, to be patient. This presents a classic picture of a life of faith. We have tremendous, think about it, we have tremendous and magnificent promises from God, which belong to us now, but by and large, we haven't experienced them yet. Because we also had, as Abraham had, we still live in a land, a land of evil. Where are these promises when we live in a land that just everywhere you turn, there's wickedness and vileness and, and evil everywhere you turn, everywhere. But Paul described this patient waiting for our future glory. This is one of my favorite texts in all scripture, in Romans chapter 8. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Mm. <clears throat> he goes on to say, For the creation, creation itself is eager, longing for the revealing of the sons of God. That's right. Everything you see, the ocean, the sky, the stars, are eager. They're moaning for God to come back and make everything right. For we know the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this we hope, in this hope we are saved. Not hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. I don't know about you, but I want to go to glory now. Now. That's what my spirit says to me. Because I'm tired of seeing this corruption and filth. And, and not only it, it's being exalted and celebrated, But before we get to this glorious future, we must live in this world as aliens. This is not our home. We are no longer part of it. Since the day you were saved, you were no longer a part of this world. And one of my favorite texts in Scripture explains, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, Do not love the world or the things in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. This is how Christians have lived in every generation since Abraham, alienated from the world's ways. Remember when Jesus was praying his high priestly prayer? And he says, Father, I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but just keep them from the evil. Because he will not stop attacking you while you're in this world. He will not. And the more you conform to this world, he's got you. He's got you. Pastor Bob is going through the book of Habakkuk. I'm going to throw you another plug. I think you're getting your crotch because I'm throwing you plugs. <laughs> <laughs> But the prophet had the same concerns 3,000 years ago that we have today. Sure. Lord, what are you doing? Obviously, you see what's going on. What are you doing about it? 
A bank account, tell you what, if you had a pair, man, my man, I wouldn't ask that guy that way, but you know what? He says, back it. First of all, two things, shut your hole, number one. And number two, you have no idea what I'm doing behind the scenes. You have no idea. I'm doing something that you wouldn't believe if you even, even if I told you, right? That's, right. It's the same today. Can we get like this? Do not give me that righteous holy love. Do not, don't ever say, why? Where are you? I say that a lot. I do. I do. I just, I just get so tired. Of, 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 not the sin itself, but the exaltation of it. The celebrating of it. It's so evil to me. How we can hand out commemorative pens on signing new abortion laws in. Are you serious? That's when I say, now, Lord, bring your judgment now on these people. But who are we? Who are we? Hey, Ted, he could have came back in 1998 when you weren't even saved yet. You would have been in that world eternity. What do you think of those apples? You like apples? What do you think of those apples? Who are we to question his timing? Right? Think about that. If it was a hundred years, none of you would be here. None of you. It's tough sometimes living in a world run by Satan. Amen? A world that exalts sinful behavior condemns righteousness. And also, if Satan can do nothing only what God allows, it doesn't make it any easier. We know that God is sovereign, of course we, but doesn't it make it any easier? No, it doesn't. The Apostle Peter knew this. He said in his epistle, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which war against your soul. You know what that means? We're fighting two battles, ladies and gentlemen. We're fighting against Satan. And oh yeah, here we go. We're fighting against ourselves. We're fighting against our own flesh. That's, that's, that's a harder fight. I don't know about you, but it is for me. That's a harder fight for me. That's what Peter's saying. Not only the world get wars against us, but our, as fallen creatures, we war within ourselves. The Christian way is tough, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm not, for you young people, you're in for a war. You're in for a war. So I'm preparing you now. Because the older you get, the harder it's going to get, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not going to share it though. For all of us. For children, children, grandchildren. It all depends on when Jesus comes in. But Paul told Timothy, Timothy. It's a good fight. It's a fight worth fighting for. So I fought the good fight, Timothy. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. With the Lord, the righteous judge will award to me on that day. Hallelujah. It is a good fight, ladies and gentlemen. It is a good fight. Our text concludes with one of the greatest statements in Scripture. Look at verse 10. For Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. The secret of Abraham's patience was his hope was on the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise. His ultimate promised land was heaven, just as ours is. He wasn't looking forward to the physical land of Canaan. He was looking to the eternal land of Canaan whose designer and builder is God. And as important as the earthly land was to him and God's promises, look, he looked to the heavenly land, which he knew he, he would inherit without fail. In other words, he was looking beyond Canaan to where we will dwell with God forever. Yeah. And that, that focus, that focus that he had got him through all the tough times that he endured. Same with us. That's why Paul said, set your mind on the heavenly things, not on things in this. And he's so true with that. When we focus too much on this earth, it will hinder your faith. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, because I, I've learned the hard way. When I get engaged in all these 
Facebook, Google, all these stupid arguments. It just hinders your faith. When you get caught up in these stairs, and I call them stairs of the devil, it just, it just, just forget about it. Just don't even, just keep your eyes focused on the glory of Christ. That's patience. And, and living in such an evil land, that is patience because we not, we got to keep our focus here. We need to keep our focus on the glory of God. John MacArthur said this about this verse. I love this. He said, the Christian is willing to forsake the present glory, comfort, and satisfaction of this present world for the future glory that is in Christ. In contrast to buy now, pay later attitude prevalent in the world today, the Christian is willing to pay now and receive later. I love that. I absolutely love that. Perfectly said. And he got this from Romans 8, 18, which I already said. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed with us. When our minds are on eternity, we will be patient in understanding what happens down here as it did with Abraham. Abraham lived in a vile time as Noah did. But he kept focused on the glory of Christ. He kept focused on the big picture. And Abraham, he didn't look at the process of salvation, but he looked at its final conclusion. Perfect peace, I'm sorry, perfect light in perfect peace in a perfect world with a perfect God. That's what he looked forward to. Yeah. And that's what she, we should do as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this amazing example of a man of faith. Father, thank you so much for your effectual call, Lord. Thank you for calling each one, Lord, to salvation. Thank you, Father, for revealing these truths to us, Lord, to opening up our heart to the things of Christ, Lord. We're so thankful. We did not seek you, Lord, but you sought us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It is not of our doing, Lord. It's strictly your sovereign will. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us before the, before the world even began. Father, we're grateful for these wonderful and beautiful examples of men of faith. Father, help us to emulate these men. Thank you, Lord, for your truth. And Lord, you would take up our offering, Father. I pray that you would multiply it, bless it, Father. Use it for the spreading of your kingdom right here in Palm Coast. We pray this in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, our King, great God, and Savior. Amen. Amen. Amen.